Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon all of you. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-ameen. Nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. On behalf of Center for Sustainable Development of Muslim World UK, I am welcoming all of you in our today's international webinar on World Environment Day 2021. And the theme of today's topic is ecosystem restoration. Marhaban bikum fi hadihi tanmiyah al mubaraka alati tunazimuha bi barkazi tanmiyah al mustadama lil alam al islami bi muna saba yawmul bay'a al alami. Respected viewers and honorable guests, as you all know that uh, 5 June every year it has been celebrated worldwide as World Environment Day. And the concept is it is celebrated annually to encourage awareness and environmental protection. And according to the United Nations, the celebration of this day provides us with an opportunity to broaden the basis for an enlightened opinion and responsible conduct by individuals, enterprises, and communities in preserving and enhancing the environment. The day is celebrated by engaging governments, businesses, celebrities, and citizens to focus their efforts on a pressing environmental issue. So to observe this day with importance, Center for Sustainable Development of Muslim World UK has been organized today's international webinar and a number of uh, researchers, uh, renowned personalities from different corners of the globe, we have been invited them in our webinar today. And my role will be just to uh, facilitate and by timekeeping, and the, our speakers, they are the main personalities today to deliver their speeches. So we have with us as the chair, Dr. Aishat Muniza. She is an associate professor, INCEIF Malaysia. And at, and at the same time, she was a, a former deputy minister, Ministry of Finance and Treasury, Republic of Maldives. So I humbly welcome our honorable chair in our today's session. Uh, we have with us a, a number of renowned scholars. Uh, we already have with us uh, Khaled Saifullah. He is a PhD researcher on climate finance, Glasgow Caledonian University, UK. I welcome our honorable guest. We have with us uh, Tipu Sultan. He is a senior lecturer, Renaissance School of Business, Brittany, France. We have with us as well Dr. Yusuf uh, D-I-N-C, uh, forgive me if I uh, mistake the names in pronunciation. Uh, he's an associate professor, Department of Islamic Economics and Finance, I-Z-U. He's also a director of Management, Entrepreneurship and Leadership Research Center of Istanbul, Sabah Timzaim University, Turkey. I welcome our honorable guest as well. We have with us as well, uh, after some time, uh, Dr. Abida Malik, she is the Director of Studies, PhD Supervisor, Center for Islamic Finance, University of Bolton, UK. She will be joining with us. And we have with us Dr. Salman Ahmed Shaykh. He is an Associate Professor, SZABIST University, Karachi, Pakistan. So I welcome all of our honorable guests today in our session. So with the speech of uh, Brother Khalid Saifullah, we will be starting our program and uh, he will be talking about ecosystem restoration from Islamic perspective, Islamic notion. Uh, so at the beginning of this session, I humbly welcome uh, Brother Khalid Saifullah and request him to deliver his speech on ecosystem restoration from Islamic perspective. and as well our beloved audiences uh, who are watching from uh, which, whichever part of the world you are watching from. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. And welcome everyone. A very good morning from my part. Welcome everyone to our today's discussion. Uh, the topic that I have been assigned uh, is about discussing the Islamic notion on ecosystem restoration. Uh, I would love to share uh, my thoughts and ideas that I have compiled um, after having the discussion issues on my hand. Uh, I hope uh, you will have a good journey throughout the uh, 
a slight discussion. So let us start with the need for the call that IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, they have noted that some of the biggest problems humankind are facing currently are the combination of ecological challenges. It combines the climate changes, its consequences, like slow onset uh, consequences, it could be sea level rise, increased natural disasters, and global pandemics, as well large scale loss and extinction of species, as well decreased renewable fresh water sources and a system. Uh, this is very important. It is too fragile to adapt to the rapidly occurring uh, changes. This is from the perspective of climate issues and environmental issues. However, the sacred scripture that has given to us from Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the Quran, and the practices of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the teachings of Islam, this all urge humanity to value and protect the nature. But unfortunately, those lessons are largely unknown to many Muslims, including how they relate to the contemporary environmental issues such as climate change, ecosystem destruction and overconsumption. And more seldom have we seen these ideas reproduced in our religious fatwas or as implemented action. Therefore, we, we, we consider, we urge that Islam provides the remedies to global debate on growth and sustainability. And its development model argues for achieving prosperity without increasing the ecological footprint. And we believe that Islam views the role of the individual as a value creator, a steward, and a reformer. And there are some issues and principles to take care of that are social equity, governance, good governance, participation, degrowth, conservation, etc. This is to restore the ecosystem from the perspective of Islam. So this leads us to the discussion of Islamic eco-theology, where Islamic worldview defines not only living a life, rather living a good life, which is Hayat al and as well living a lifestyle, which is uh, called Zuhud, living lightly on the earth, as well caring for both people and the nature. This is not only one direction that we are interacting only with people, as well with nature. And the holistic view of Islam founded on the notion of the harmony that there are natural state or fitra that should be taken care of, as well as we have to respect the balance or mizan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala established on the earth. And as well, we have to be careful enough about the proportion or the miqdar Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala settles in the universal system or ecosystem. This actually constructs the ideas of Islamic eco-theology that include all those concepts and percepts that is referred in the Sharia as Allah's design of natural world or ilm al-khala and humans' responsibility for its utilization, its preservation, and its maintenance. You'll be very strange to know that Muslim eco-theologists, uh, they have compiled around 750 verses of the Quran. Those are related to the creation of natural world the laws and uh, that govern it and its impact on the quality of human life. For example, the word ma'a, uh, that is water, it appeared more than 60 places in Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentioned it as an origin of whole biological life. This is in chapter 21, verse 30. And Quran also provides every minute's detail regarding the source of water, its forms, its cycling, its impact on the entire ecosystem. And as well, many chapters of the Quran are named after specific animals and natural incidents, such as the cow, the cattle, the thunder, the bee, the ant, the daybreak, the sun, the night, the pig, the elephant, you can name it. That indicates that Islamic theology does not only recognize human as a human, but it also recognizes human as an independent. Uh, this is not only recognize the human as independent of its surrounding environment, it considers human as a component of its surrounding environment. So 
Humans' attitude towards the environment should be based on the principle of justice, adil, and also the principle of hikmah, wisdom, and also the principle of compassion or rahmah. And we have to be aware of Allah's presence as these are the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means the environment where we are living, this is as well a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also ayatullah. These are the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It reminds us the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just yesterday I was visiting a Peak District, which is a very naturally uh, biologically protected area of uh, where I live in Sheffield. If you climb on the mountains, you, you feel that how little we are in comparison to the nature and environment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted to us. It reminds us in every minute of the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I will slowly drive you uh, throughout the discussion of these three principles that we have to remind. Today I was looking through the UN websites that have discussed about recreate, reimagine, and restore uh, about today's uh, restoration of uh, ecology. From our discussion or from our perspective, uh, we will consider these three discussion through recreating the trusteeship principle, reimagining the conservation principle, and restoring the divine balance principle. Let us discuss uh, what are these issues about. Restoration of principle of trusteeship. This establishes the nature of relationship between God, human, and the earth. We all know that the famous verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us as a khalifa on the earth. So art is a divine gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we are here as a trustee on the earth to protect it, to take care of the earth. You can see this throughout the chapter uh, Surah Baqarah, also chapter 6, also chapter 35. So that's the principle that's established that the environmental uh, relationship with us and Almighty, this is a triology uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the art as well, the human, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the responsibility to one component to take care of others. So the environmental crisis that we are observing now is a failure of human trusteeship and Islam views the root cause of global warming and its ecological destruction is due to the absence or lack of human stewardship and the deviation and departure from the fitrah or the natural state. Modern technocentric human that fully dependent on the energy resources that has abandoned the principle of stewardship and started behaving we started behaving like owner rather than a steward or trustee, or we started behaving like a consumer rather than a version of, or the protector of the environment. And this has changed the nature of relationship from owner to the trustee, and has become the root cause of today's environmental disequilibrium. And there is a call and we urge that to rebuild the concept, the concept of trusteeship rather than ownership to improve the arts conditions and to protect the ecology from humans exploitative behavior. The next conservation principle that we are urging a call to restore, you will see that there are overexploitation, overconsumption and wastefulness, which is a straw in the concept of Islam of natural resources. They are the major contributing factors of today's uh, ecological vulnerability. And for the Muslims, conservation of resources is not a reactionary method to avoid the resource dust. Rather, the conservation principle is an active process and an active component of faith. Quran mentions and chapter number six and chapter number seven, but waste not by, by access. For Allah loves not the wasters. Uh, it's kudu wa shalabu wa la tisrifu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is encouraging us not to over exploit, not to over consume. And there are prophetic lessons of conservation behavior. This is to uh, develop.
example of our personal behavior. Uh, it is from uh, uh, referring to the event of Udu by uh, our companion Sa'ad. And when Prophet Sallallahu was passing him, he was uh, discussing about wasting water and over consuming the water during uh, during performing Udu for the prayer. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was reminding him not to use excess natural resources during that time, even it is from flowing river water. So this basically um, remind us about how we should uh, establish our relationship between uh, natural resources and us. And Islam always remind us not to exceed the limit in consumption, including all biological and physical elements of art that are considered as a grave sin and also the violation of the divine balance. So here, our art is to establish the minimalist approach when we consume anything and more specifically the natural resources. This leads us to the discussion of restoration of the last principle, which is divine balance. Uh, Islam reinforces the scientific concept of chain of life or the ecosystem, wherein all living species depend on each other for their survival. And Quran mentions about this divine balance and uh, Surah Rahman. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, from verse number seven to verse number nine, that and he has raised up the sky and he has set a balance, that you exceed not the balance, but observe the balance strictly, nor fall short thereof. So this is about the mizan Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about here. And in our relentless pursuit of economic growth and consumption, we disrupted this balance on the atmosphere that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was saying that uh, he set on the sky. And this atmospheric uh, imbalance or uh, disruption from either CO2 emission or ozone depletion or different kind of pollution has brought us through another root of the consequences that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in uh, chapter number seven. The destruction of this balance is considered as facade. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cautions us, do not make facade on the earth after it has been set in order. And human actions are responsible for the global ecological crisis and climate related disaster that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned us in chapter number 30, Zahra al-Fasadu fil barri wal bahri, that is about calamities or facade that have appeared on both land and sea because of human deeds. So Allah may let them taste part of the consequences what they did, perhaps they may return. This last portion of the verse gives us the uh, confidence or optimism that uh, probably we will return. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects us that we will return actually what destruction we have made. And that is the call of this, uh, of this day today from the UN to restore the balance. And here our call is to restore the balance in land and ocean to avoid the climate change. You will see a lot of documents that has been published from IPCC that is either on uh, saving the ocean or saving the different atmospheric uh, components of the land. Here is a little way forward. Uh, this is for actions, practical actions. I have just summed up uh, from my understanding. Uh, I will start from the beginning that is about focusing on justice, focusing on degrowth, sustainability and harmony between uh, the nature and human. We also have to have a shift from the general form of environmentalism that is just we are purchasing some green uh, products, we are looking some green labeling on the product while we are buying our uh, daily groceries from the stores or we are consuming uh, I mean, uh, less plastic related issues, we are becoming plastic savvy, or we are kind of avoiding pollution like transforming our normal car to an electric car. This will not actually help uh, to save the environment broadly because the ecological destruction that has been made uh, 
is far beyond that. So we have to have, of course, we need the first general kind of environmentalism, but we have to slowly um, shift from there to a transformative Islamic ecology. And specifically, this is a call to Islamic countries. They can actually be a model, whereas European countries are now a model to uh, green development or uh, climate leadership. So we can have a transition. We can have, specifically, this is a call for uh, Gulf countries in the Middle East, wh where they are basically dependent on their oil or fossil fuel resources. They have to keep exploding the renewable energy resources for their economic development. And on a very personal level, there is a call about the consumption in economics. When we go to purchase something here in uh, European economies, we go for searching for halal labeling. And we are happy with that, that this is halal, that's okay, then we don't need to think anything about what is behind it. But still beyond that halal thing, we have to also ensure the sustainability of whole, whole production system and the supply chain. And just a few days ago, I was watching a documentary which is called Seas Piracy. They are discussing that when we buy tuna can, we see that it is dolphin friendly. So when they fish that or catches the tuna fish, they don't kill the uh, dolphin during that time. But they actually say these labeling are easy to purchase from the companies. You will just give them money and they will give you the label. You will just put it there. You don't need to comply. Nobody is going uh, to the sea to check you that whether you are dolphin free, I mean, you are dolphin safe or not. So the whole, they say uh, the whole fisheries industry or th they are killing the ecosystem of the uh, ocean because of overfishing. And their final line regarding that is to save the ocean is to leave where it is, just leave it and it will be safe. So just to check the level is not enough. We have to also check the whole uh, production system and the supply chain because we are the consumer. If we uh, drop the product, they will must uh, come forward to ensure the whole production system. Yes. Regarding yes. The finance, uh, I, I will conclude within a few minutes. Uh, Jazakallah for the reminder. Regarding the finance, investors' advocacy for green Islamic financial investment is a must because the investors will create the demand uh, and the pressure to the uh, companies. And we also urge reviving the Green Endowment Fund or work concept to support a transition to a sustainable economy by promoting green innovation or uh, ijtihad inspired by nature and culture. We also call a greening our religion. That means activism by our religious leaders. This is imams and the scholars in teaching both a spiritual dimension as well as scientific knowledge and environmental restoration. And finally, we also are reformulating the fiqh or Islamic legal tradition to take the ecological dimension really seriously. And this is high time. There are some global efforts that has been uh, circulated around. In 2015, the Islamic Climate Change Symposium, they adopted this uh, declaration on global climate change, where they made a call that we will follow the footsteps of our Prophet وسلم, and the words of Quran to solve the problem. And there are other kind of global effort that has been initiated by UN Environment Program that they have a program called Faith for Art Initiative. And under that, they have uh, signed a charter that's called Al Mizan, a covenant for art. And these are some uh, basically uh, uh, initiatives that are leading us. And we have to actually uh, sign those uh, initiatives and come forward to support them. And this is my final slide that ecosystem restoration, this is the last minute call in Islam. Um, I will just remind you through a uh, hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who says, if the Qiyamah, the last hour comes while you have a sapling on your hand and it is possible to plant it before the hour comes, you should plant it. It reminds that the sustaining or investing in nature's growth, even when it is immaterial for the humankind. Jazakallah for your time and so much patience for going through my slides. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Khalid Saifullah, for your wonderful deliberation. We were listening uh, some very insightful deliberation, especially the action plan from Khalid Saifullah. So thank you again for your wonderful deliberation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, uh, the World Environment Day 2021, the theme of this year is ecosystem restoration. And Pakistan as a country will be the global host for the day. And this day will kick off the UN decade on ecosystem restoration that is 2021 to 2030. A global mission to revive billions of hectares from forest to farmlands, from the top of mountains to the depth of the sea. And in a very short, the ecosystem is a community of plants and animals interacting with each other in a given area and also with their non-living environments. And the non-living environments include uh, weather, uh, earth, uh, sun, soil, climate and atmosphere. And it relates to the way that all three different atmos organisms live in close proximity to each other and how they interact with each other. So uh, their audience and respected uh, guard, uh, guests, uh, at this point of time, we will be listening from Tipu Sultan. He's a senior lecturer at Rhin's School of Business in Brittany, France, and he will be delivering his speech based on importance of one environment day. So brother Tipu Sultan now, please. Just want to make sure you can hear me. Yes, 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 yes. Now it's okay. Okay, merci. Merci uh, Thank you very much. I uh, my name is Tipu. I uh, I am in Ren School of Business. It's uh, it's pronounced as Ren, and um, I'll be uh, making uh, a few notes on the World Environment Day. I don't have access on my laptop, so I can't share the slides, and I will be just talking. I apologize in advance. Um, I think. I think uh, the word environment is extremely important because if we just look at a few numbers, not much, but a few numbers with every three seconds, according to the United Nations, every three seconds, the world loses uh, enough forest to cover a football field, uh, which is a lot. And that's every th three seconds, not minutes, not hours, every three seconds. And uh, for the last century, we have destroyed about half of our wetlands, as much as 50% of our uh, coral reefs have already been lost. Up to 90% of the coral reefs have uh, probably will be lost, according to the UN survey in 2050, uh, even if global warming is limited to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Well, that's within the climate, uh, the Paris climate, uh, the, the Paris uh, climate um, uh, agreement. Uh, so even if we go by the standards uh, which are very high standards by the Paris Climate uh, Accord, it would still be a 90% loss to the world's coral reefs. Uh, ecosystem loss is depriving the world of obviously carbon sinks, uh, which are forests and uh, pit lands and uh, time humanity can least afford it, of course. And that's, uh, that's, that goes without saying. And global greenhouse uh, gas emissions have grown uh, for consecutive three years and the planet has uh, been uh, one piece for potentially a, a catastrophic climate uh, disaster. And the uh, emergence, obviously uh, we can see COVID-19 has also shown us how disastrous the consequences of an ecosystem loss can be by shrinking the area of natural habitat for animals. Uh, we're also creating a, um, a very bad uh, circumstance uh, for everyone. Uh, with this uh, big and challenging picture, I think this World Environment Day is, uh, is a focus on the ecosystem restoration and theme is uh, this year is reimagine and recreate. Uh, it uh, for this year, uh, we uh, the World Environment Day is, um, I think if I'm not mistaken, um, it is a rotating, uh, rotating uh, presidency. So it, this year it is going to be held in Pakistan. Um, correct me if I'm wrong in 2021 and uh, it is uh, for this theme the world environment day um, uh, i think pakistan is the host on wednesday i think pakistan already kick started uh, the event with a cycling event to generate a awareness regarding ecosystem restoration uh, the united nations uh, has been um, the un and decade on ecosystem restoration uh, is part of a sequence of joint events held by the who and the World Health Organization, the um, joint venture is will solicit to 
reimagine, re uh, reinforce uh, multi sectoral collaboration and engagement at human, animal, plant, ecosystem uh, levels and interface, uh, also known as uh, One Health. Uh, the collaboration of WHO with the UN, uh, I think it came uh, just a day prior to the World Environment Day, which is observed every year on June 5. And so um, with this, I I uh, was listening to my brother who was speaking prior to me, and it was so wonderful that he uh, linked the, uh, how he linked the Islamic, uh, Islamic financial principles and also the core principles of Sharia to the Islamic uh, Islam to the world environment, and it's very important indeed because uh, here in France, uh, we are very conscious uh, of the world environment day. And uh, France is, I think, one of the first and foremost country that uh, uh, pride itself in uh, spearheading and being the torchbearer of uh, global environmentalism. If you can see, it is uh, the, the Paris Climate Accord was held in Paris uh, on the auspices of the French president. And it's still um, very much uh, an endeavor for the world, but uh, France in itself has been taking the lead uh, in making a profound change to our practices uh, in terms of effective multilateral action on uh, environmental uh, change. Uh, the speed and scope of the consequences of the environmental crisis uh, that we see today uh, are unprecedented. And therefore, I think the, um, it's very important for us to control the greenhouse gases and uh, for us to uh, make sure that uh, we control it before it goes out of hand. Uh, it's not just a, a crisis for Muslims, it's a crisis for everyone. And for sure, Islam being the, the second biggest religion of the world, being two billion people in population is uh, has a very, very important role to play. And uh, being, um, I think the, the, uh, with the, with the increase, the exponential, I will say, not just the increase, but the exponential increase in the Islamic finance, uh, the the role that Islamic ethics in terms of environmental protection and uh, environmental protection that it can play is also increasing in, in eminence. And you see the European uh, sphere of Islamic finance, how it's growing. Uh, you see uh, within Europe, the sectoral increase in both, in, in both financing and deposits in in Islamic finance, financial instruments is, is increasing and it has never decreased for the last 10 years despite the uh, very negative uh, press that Muslims get uh, generally. Uh, I mean, stereotypically, it's a taboo, but it's uh, it's it's without without reference to that, uh, Islamic finance has been on the rise. And therefore, uh, you see that there is an eminence and increase in the education of Islamic finance within France. Uh, so within France, we have many universities that, including my university, that have uh, courses on Islamic finance. And um, there are publications uh, that uh, are uh, happening now. And so two days ago, there was a publication by a Greek, uh, not a Greek, uh, Greece, Greece, where? Wait, Greek, uh, by a Greek professor uh, in our school uh, on the res uh, sustainable responsible investment management principles in, in, in within the purview of Islamic finance. And also in Greece, there is a bond, there is an Islamic Sharia compliant bond and that will, uh, that that is in the process right now, as I'm speaking of taking place. So you can see the, the growing eminence of Islamic finance and the role that Islamic finance and Islamic financial principles can paint can play in terms of uh, making a very proactive change uh, in uh, obviously environmental practices because I uh, was very happy to, to hear you when you said that the Islamic uh, principle of man being not on uh, man-made resources only to meet man-made ends. Well, that's a problem because we are created by Allah, as you said. and. Uh, um, and it's uh, it's it's something that um, that is a Western psychology, which which is in itself um, I, I have nothing to explain on that because it's self-explanatory. But the Sharia principles on on that is um, um, is is actually more convincing uh, 
uh, so it's very important that you mention that and I actually was thinking about it that how we as Khalifa uh, can preserve the will of God because at the end of the day the Islamic principles uh, is the submission of the will to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so it's very important that our will uh, remains uh, sub submitted uh, to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I uh, completely concur and uh, concur and agree with the with the respectful speaker uh, and um, Allah has created the the the, the universe uh, so it's very important for us to understand that he is the one who has created and for us it's very important for us to understand that he is the one who has created and for us it's uh, it's uh, it's a responsibility and that responsibility is divine uh, and that is very important to understand because uh, that divinity will uh, drive the passion for responsibility not just in management but also in practices in general so um thank you very much i cannot emphasize enough i had slides thank you. Shared, but i think i've said enough and thank Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Brother Tipu Sultan, for his wonderful deliberation. And he also emphasized the relation of uh, uh, world environment, the perspective of it in, in, in relation with the Islamic notion and what uh, our brother Khalid Saifullah, he managed uh, properly in his uh, uh, slide uh, quite earlier. Uh, what uh, Brother Tipu Sultan mentioned, that is the ecosystem, it actually means preventing, uh, halting, and resolving this damage, what already happened to go from exploiting nature to healing it. And it means assisting in the recovery of ecosystems that had been degraded or already destroyed, as well as conserving the ecosystems that are still intact. And restoration uh, can only happen in many ways, for example, through actively planting or by removing pressure so that nature can recover on its own that is very important issue so we will be now listening um future world 2030 environmental perspective uh, on that on that topic we will be listening now from dr salman ahmed sheikh uh, he is an assistant professor uh sjabist university karachi pakistan so i request uh, dr salman ahmed sheikh to deliver his speech please Dr. Salman, can you hear? Can you hear me? Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, uh, not now. Yes, yes, okay. All right. All right. Uh, first of all, assalamu alaikum uh, and thank you to Brother Khalid, the Professor Aisha, and the esteemed guests from around the world uh, who are here uh, in this forum. And uh, we have already dis uh, discussed a uh, few things uh, about um, uh, eco restoration and sustainable development. Uh, I would talk about sustainable development in post-COVID-19 world uh, scenario and how Islamic finance, including the Islamic commercial finance institutions as well as the uh, social finance institutions, uh, can help to contribute towards mobilizing resources uh, which are required for sustainable development, especially in the post-COVID-19 uh, world. My presentation would be talking about the sustainable development goals and I would also uh, give uh, results of one of my study with Professor Dr. Kabir Hassan, uh, where we try to measure uh, the sustainable development in OIC countries and look at the uh, state of uh, development or underdevelopment from the uh, SDG perspective. And then I would talk about what Islamic finance can offer through its uh, value system, teachings, uh, as well as uh, instruments and institutions to contribute towards uh, SDGs. 
Now, if we talk about some basic facts, uh, we have uh, already deliberated on um, challenges that we have in terms of uh, increased poverty, uh, hunger, especially in the post-COVID-19 scenario, especially in regions which were already uh, underprivileged uh, in South Asia, in Africa, and so on, uh, and Latin America as well. And we also uh, know that there is a high income inequality, and that is uh, further worsened by this uh, COVID-19 crisis. We also know that um, we are emitting a lot of carbon, and um, our developed countries are more to blame for it. Uh, the richest 10% of the world's population is responsible for 50% of all uh, carbon emissions, according to Oxfam. Uh, we also know that um, uh, interventions that are happening in terms of aid, they are not enough. If we compare the debt servicing burden with the aid that comes in, what we find is that more money flows out of poor countries in debt servicing debt than what comes in in the form of uh, aid. And we also um, have this uh, problem that we focus only on markets, whereas the economy is uh, uh, beyond markets as well. Uh, we talk about efficiency, inefficiency, but we ignore the fact that about $2.75 billion value of food is wasted every day. And uh, we only need about $600 million to feed um, uh, about 600 million people poor people who are uh, extremely poor. So if we give them dollar a day, it would amount to just $600 million. Whereas uh, the amount of food that we waste, if we convert it into value terms, according to FAO, uh, it's about $2.75 billion value of food. So the problem is more with distribution of resources. Uh, uh, as per the Oxfam report, we know that uh, there are very handful of people who own a huge amount of wealth. Uh, and um, if we have a financial system that is providing interest cover to, to the wealth, and if we have uh, um, uh, scenarios where uh, taxes can be weighted and offshore wealth can be, uh, can be retained, then what happens is that uh, we are not able to mobilize enough resources to, uh, to cater to these challenges. So what we need is a value system, a worldview that looks beyond self-interest, looks at common good, uh, it looks at uh, solving these problems of uh, poverty, inequality directly. And uh, we need to have a financial system that is also conducive to that. Uh, a, a, financial, a financial system that is only lending money on interest uh, and requiring collateral would be very exclusive to some of uh, you know the sections of the population. The rich people, the rich capitalists would be able to obtain credit, but the commoner uh, would not be able to access finance. We talk about financial inclusion, but that is only talked about in terms of um, mobilizing the deposits, not in terms of creating um, credit facilities for the poor people. So a large number of small savers in the capitalist financial system, in the capitalist banking system, basically uh, give their deposits to an intermediary uh, who then uh, provides credit to only a small number of big corporates and upper class people. So this is a system where uh, we, we see that the inequality is inbuilt into it. And this can cause rise in, in inequality. And that is also confirmed by data. We have books like uh, uh, by Thomas Piketty and uh, by others. And we know that inequality is on the rise despite high economic growth rate. So there is a need for an economic framework that brings back moderation, responsibility, conservation, dignity of life, empathy, sharing, equitable distribution, and justice in society. And this is what uh, basically uh, Islamic uh, economic framework is, uh, is, um, is built with. And it, and it has these, uh, um, uh, it has a value system that caters to all these uh, different kinds of uh, attributes that we are talking about. Now, if we talk about specifically the environmental and development crisis, we have unprecedented burning of fossil fuels, rapid deforestation, contamination of seas, and this has resulted in rising temperature, frequent heat waves, floods, melting of glaciers, and enormous loss of uh, biodiversity. So all of these are facts and we know about them. Now, what can we do uh, and what we have seen being done uh, to cater to this? Now, I have already talked about high income inequality and, and, and th there is a picture at the bottom of this screen, which you can see, uh, by Oxfam, and it shows that uh, income inequality is on the rise. 
Um, and uh, when we talk about underdevelopment challenges, they are there and they are becoming even more challenging, especially in scenario where we have developed countries also facing uh, low economic growth rates, even recession and unemployment, and they are not able to basically uh, fulfill their commitments uh, uh, in terms of aid, in terms of providing resources to the developing countries. And uh, not even we see um, debt relief or debt uh, stand still, uh, which is necessary for developing countries to meet these uh, underdevelopment challenges. Now, um, we talked about sustainable development goals. These were decided upon by um, a lot of countries. A lot of countries agreed to it. And in fact, um, uh, work has been uh, done on it as well. But then came the COVID-19 scenario. And then uh, we see that there is, uh, there is uh, um, a slowness in the progress. Now, the beauty of these sustainable development goals is that they do not just look at the economy. They look at uh, uh, human life and not just human life, but life in general uh, on this planet. So um, sustainable development goals cater to economic growth, but they cater to human development and they also cater to the environmental challenges like we can see in some of these uh, goals. So uh, having no poverty, having zero hunger is put at the forefront and then uh, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, all of these are put in uh, before we talk about in uh, sustainable development goal, the idea of decent work and economic growth. And that has to be uh, responsible as well, inclusive as well. So we talk about reducing income inequalities, responsible consumption and production. And then we also talk about being responsible with the environment and uh, to the other life forms that we have on this planet, life below water as well as life on land. So uh, these goals are very beautiful. But... Uh, uh, in came COVID-19 and the scenario changed. There is low growth, high expenditure on relief efforts, high fiscal deficit. And what it does is it leaves less resources for investment in environmental projects. So projects relying on private crowdfunding face constraints as corporations and labor force, which were basically contributing to these causes and projects, they see the decline in their incomes. And uh, some gains that we had in the last few years have been reversed as well. Poverty has increased. There is rise in hunger. In terms of health, we have 3.8 million deaths and we are still counting. But we also need to take into account that air pollution itself just kills about 7 million people uh, every year. So in about 18 months, we have had 3.8 million deaths from COVID-19. But air pollution uh, in, a, in a routine year just kills 7 million. Uh, million people. So uh, we have been uh, catching to the challenge of uh, COVID-19, but we also need to take into account that um, uh, environmental challenges are almost uh, as much lethal and in fact uh, more lethal as we see from this statistic. Uh, SDG 4 talked about education, but we see that there are a lot of countries, a lot of regions where there is no schooling for almost one and a half year. Uh, there is increased unemployment. This has reversed some of the gains in SDG 8, which talked about decent work opportunities. There is decline in industrial growth and overall economic growth. Large corporations have survived, but the retail sector, informal sector, uh, micro entrepreneurs, they have suffered a lot. So the SDG 10, which talked about reduced income inequalities, what we see is that uh, uh, income inequalities uh, are on the rise and uh, there are the access to relief efforts is also uh, quite um, uh, not uh, equitable as well. Uh, and then we see that more using of packaging material in e-commerce because when you are going to a shopping mall uh, to uh, make purchases, you might uh, take your own shopping bag. You might just carry some things uh, in hand as well. But uh, when e-commerce uh, uh, grows, uh, the use of plastics, the use of packaging material increases, especially plastic. And um, there is also more nuclear travel. So the mass transit is... Uh, is a stop due to uh, 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 maintaining social distancing. But what happens is that uh, when people are traveling alone uh, in a single car, which has a capacity of five people or more people, so uh, this uh, also burns more carbon per, uh, per person as compared to before. Law and order has deteriorated in some countries as well because uh, the people are not able to get uh, enough uh, uh, relief uh, support from the government, so uh, they might opt to uh, some illegal uh, activities as well. So the law and order situation has also worsened, uh, which was uh, emphasized upon in SDG 16. So there are challenges. Now, if we talk about measuring sustainable development, we did one effort in a study 
uh, we took some indicators related to each of the SDGs, uh, like for poverty and hunger and so on. And then we computed an index uh, by averaging all the numbers uh, related to each of the SDGs. And then we came up with a ranking of OIC countries. Now, what we found was the, the, the main point, the, the, the crux uh, or the, the takeaway point was that uh, countries which were having a high level of uh, economic growth and development, like the countries in uh, Europe or East Asia, these OIC countries were able to do much better. But uh, when we talk about this uh, second set of countries, which you see from the uh, right panel of the table, what we see is that the African countries and the South Asian uh, Muslim majority countries, uh, which are part of the OIC, uh, they were having very, very, um, you can say sluggish performance on the sustainable development index. So that is where more resources are required. And that is where the indigenous resource mobilization is uh, quite a problem. So we uh, heard from our um, brother uh, Khalid Saifullah that we need to de-emphasize on growth. We need to emphasize on degrowth. But the challenge is that if we do not see growth happening in some of these countries, they would not be able to have enough uh, employment generated and enough uh, resources mobilized. And in the face of not having enough external uh, uh, funding coming in or the debt coming in, uh, soft debt coming in, uh, it's very uh, challenging for these countries. So they need to find a balance. They need growth, but it has to be more responsible. It has to be inclusive. It has to avoid all the ills of uh, exclusive growth that we have experienced in the uh, second half of the 20th century. Now, if we talk about the Islamic finance, uh, it has its value system, which basically brings in the, the, the responsibility factor um, in the preferences, in the choices. And then we have uh, specific institutions uh, in the commercial finance and social finance institutions which can cater to sustainable development. So first of all, talking about Makasid Sharia, we have um, Hifdul Deen, Hifdul Nafs, Hifdul Akal, Hifdul Nasl, Hifdul Mal. If you translate them into English, um, basically they, they emphasize on spirituality, um, physiological needs, intellectual needs, sustainability needs, economic needs. So this is a, uh, you can say, modern interpretation, which was also emphasized by brother Khalid Sefullah, that we need to um, have a, a, a fresher look at our, uh, at our understanding of uh, uh, FIC as well. So if we um, uh, give it a contemporary, uh, you can say, um, uh, picture, not uh, undermining what the meanings of these terms are, but just extending their uh, meanings, we can uh, basically uh, see a lot of um, uh, contributing factors which are uh, very conducive for sustainable development. Like uh, when we talk about the spirituality, the belief system, the value system, the teachings which we get from the scriptures, they emphasize on moderation, responsibility and justice from the verses that have been quoted by our two speakers uh, before as well. So these are very much linked with SDG 12 and 16, which talk about moderation, which talk about responsible consumption, which talk about peace and justice. So uh, physiological needs, they emphasize on hunger, malnourishment, stunting, cleanliness, and sanitation, very much linked and sync with uh, zero poverty, zero hunger, uh, good wealth and health being, uh, and, and so on. So so there is a, a clear, uh, we, uh, we can see a clear sync between, uh, and clear link between SDGs and Makasid Sharia uh, from this slide. Uh, now, moving forward in the Islamic uh, finance architecture, if we talk about institution and instruments in Islamic finance, we have commercial finance, we have banks, we have investment funds, mutual funds, we have capital market instruments like Sukuk, we have seen Vakfling Sukuk issued in Indonesia as well very recently, we have Takaful, which is an alternative to insurance, and then we have Islamic social finance institutions as well, like Zakat and Vakf. If we talk about an Islamic economy, it works like this it has uh, commercial finance institutions as well as social finance institutions embedded in the economic framework where households uh, could be uh, as such that they have uh, uh, surplus resources they could be uh, people who are having dearth of resources scarcity of resources and who are poor so they are provided with social finance help through zakat uh, usher homes work and then uh, those households which are able to afford their purchases from the goods market they would do that directly and if they require durable goods islamic finance are there which can finance cars uh, houses and the durable goods for them and for firms as well uh, they can finance their capital goods uh, through islamic banks which provide asset-backed financing 
So this is the um, uh, Islamic economic framework in a nutshell. Now, we also need uh, mobilization of resources outside of the market as well uh, in situations where uh, commercial finance is, uh, is not uh, quite, um, uh, you can say, can, um, uh, applicable. Uh, like when banks uh, finance, they also look for the profits. But when we need resources to, let's say, combat poverty, hunger, we need to have reliance on uh, social finance institutions as well. So if you look at each of the sustainable development goals and see which of the Islamic instruments can be used to uh, meet uh, that sustainable goal, uh, we uh, get this kind of a uh, picture, uh, which is summarized in this table. If we talk about no poverty, there are Islamic social finance institutions like Zakat, Waqf, Karde Hassan, which is interest-free loan, Modaraba, which is an inclusive equity-based mode of financing, uh, whereby the, the client who is provided with finance is not required to bring in capital himself. So, so that is very conducive way to provide uh, financing to the poor people who are having lack of capital, but they might have skills or the uh, inclination uh, to to um, to get those skills. So the Mudaraba based financing can also be used as well as Salam, which uh, provides funds upfront and does not require the delivery uh, um, uh, on ready basis. Uh, to combat hunger, again, we can use Zakat, Kofin, Kalde Hassan. Good health and well being, we can also include Takaful. Quality education, we can also include Takaful in that. Gender equality, we have uh, Islamic teachings which uh, uh, um, by and large are, are gender neutral, and all these uh, different kinds of instruments are also available to both men and women. In clean water and sanitation, we can have um, public finance instruments like Ijara Suku, Istisna Suku, Fak Suku. Uh, green suku, uh, that, uh, a term that we uh, often hear. These kinds of suku can be issued by the governments uh, to basically cater to the uh, needs of uh, providing clean water and sanitation. Uh, they can issue these suku to get, get the uh, financing for building the infrastructure or, uh, uh, or purchasing the infrastructure for providing clean water and sanitation facilities. Likewise, for affordable and clean energy, uh, and for decent work and growth opportunities, a combination of trade-based, lease-based, and participation-based mode of financing can be used. For reducing income inequality, the institution of zakat is very conducive because it has an inbuilt mechanism that those who have wealth above a particular threshold are required to pay zakat to those people who have wealth below that threshold. So it, there is a there is a uh, automatic mechanism of redistribution, and this redistribution is not from poor to the rich. Uh, it is from rich to the poor. Whereas in a banking system, what we see is that a small uh, number of corporate clients are provided with finance from the funds which are uh, basically invested by a large number of very small depositors. Uh, for sustainable cities and communities, we can use different kinds of suku and likewise Islamic value system and teachings guide us how we can bring in uh, responsible consumption and production, how we can cater to climate action, uh, and to preserve life below water as well as life on uh, land. Lastly, I will uh, conclude with uh, some suggestions. Islamic banks need to give priority focus to green mortgages. This is uh, an idea that is floated uh, by some um, uh, practitioners as well. So let's say if uh, a person comes for home financing, uh, if uh, that person would use, let's say, solar energy, or would uh, be using a very um, cleaner form of energy, then uh, he would be provided with a subsidy. Uh, uh, it could be funded by the central bank. It could also be uh, uh, funded by the um, commercial banks by giving priority focus to green mortgages, green car lease. So if someone wants to buy a car that runs on uh, petrol as compared to a car that is uh, a hybrid mode and more uh, environment friendly, so then the markup rates or the, the, the rental rate should be lower so that these kinds of uh, technologies and these kinds of assets are encouraged and promoted, their use is promoted. Uh, so environmental friendly infrastructure can also be financed by uh, Islamic banks uh, on a standalone basis and also by forming a consortium. Uh, government can adopt green fiscal policy by including carbon taxation, by issuing green suku, by having low duties on import of environmental friendly technology and providing subsidy to environmental friendly industries. Uh, also, government can issue uh, infrastructure uh, projects, uh, uh, suku for infrastructure projects 
for instance, Musharaka Sukuk, Istisna Sukuk, and Ijara Sukuk. Musharaka Sukuk is very useful when um, uh, a country does not have enough uh, fiscal space to finance the cost of uh, 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 issuing the Sukuk. So in Musharaka Sukuk, there is no such compulsion. You share the benefits of, uh, of the project, uh, but you are not compelled to pay a particular rate of uh, rental, which is the case in Ijara Sukuk. Islamic social finance institutions have to be uh, catered to as well because there are projects where you cannot have a market-based solution. There are projects which require provision of common property resources or public goods. Here, the markets fail. We need to bring in uh, social finance institutions as well. Finally, a uniform and universal wealth tax like Zakat can help in uh, checking wealth inequalities and reducing the uh, concentration of income and wealth. I would end here. I think I have already taken a lot of time. Uh, so thank you for listening and uh, over to Khalid. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Salman, for your very insightful uh, deliberation from your side. Uh, we, we are at the end part of our session. We will listen definitely from our chair. Uh, before that, we will listen uh, from our last uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Yusuf, and he will be discussing uh, on SDGs and the Muslim world and analysis. He is an associate professor, Department of Islamic Economics and Finance, IZU, and at the same time, Director of Management, Entrepreneurship and Leadership Research Center of Istanbul Sabah Hattim Zayim University, Turkey. So I welcome uh, Dr. Yusuf uh, to deliver his speech. Before that, just one request. Um, I already shared in our chat box uh, the live uh, link of Facebook of this session. So if you can share uh, the link to your respective networks, then other people can be enlightened from our session. So this is a humble request to you. So I would like to request now Dr. Yusuf to deliver his speech, please. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it is a really pleasure of mine to be together with you today. Thanks, dear moderator, dear chair, esteemed scholars, and uh, distinguished followers. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, as you see, they, they give me the toughest topic, SDGs and the Muslim world. It's so it is a huge uh, discussion area. I will uh, discuss the main issues at the very beginning, then I will focus on some goals of uh, SDGs. So uh, please let me share my screen for uh, presentation. I guess, yeah, yeah. So SDGs are, uh, oh, can see my uh, presentation, right? Please confirm. Yes, yes, we can okay. see it. Very good. So uh, my presentation will have the SDG goals and analysis of Muslim world. Then I will discuss a new financial model, Roska, uh, to shed lights on what Roshka is, uh, I know there are brothers from uh, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, so it is Samiti or uh, BC, or for Malaysia, uh, Paluwagan, uh, for Indonesia, Ar Arisan. Uh, we will discuss uh, this uh, uh, model and I will conclude, so I will try to catch up in 12 uh, minutes. So my main objective is to analyze the Muslim world to bring solutions for some of the uh, SDGs to be achieved. You know the goals, uh, these are the presentation. Uh, so we can discuss many, we can discuss the harmony between the SDGs and the Makassi Sharia. We can discuss some other issues, but I want to focus on uh, some deeper perspectives. So why we need SDGs, I guess, uh, it is a problem of adala, justice. So what we did, uh, humanity, uh, we divided adala. So how we made it? We divided the rights of the creatures, uh, alps, uh, in Arabic. Uh, what we introduced, human rights. So if we divide adala, like this human rights, animal rights, or if you divide, it is holistic uh, perspective then it causes a uh, problem. So SDGs with the human rights perspective, I guess we cannot succeed uh, 
to to achieve those goals and to to offer a better world for our uh, uh, generations. Uh, we should consider is holistic, and we should focus on the uh, the rights of the all creatures. So this is the main issue with SDGs, I guess. And still, if as as Muslim, if we consider SDGs from human rights perspective, we will not uh, we will not take the SDGs uh, for our uh, our own uh, highest uh, uh, wealth, let's say. So uh, when the topic delivered to me, I have uh, thought a lot uh, since. Uh, Turkey is a pilot economy on zero waste. I, I do research on those issues. Uh, I could discuss uh, that uh, with you or uh, as a co-coordinator of UN, IUM, uh, Islamic Philanthropy, Philanthropy Fund, Fund uh, initiative. I could discuss some uh, Islamic social finance part. But uh, what I experience from my travels uh, to the Muslim world and, and to the other parts of the uh, uh, world of the other continents, I found something very common in many economies. So I will discuss this, then we brought a solution on that. And uh, that one is uh, supported by ISDB, uh, URT and uh, will, uh, will be projected soon, inshallah. I will discuss that model, and I will uh, discuss uh, SDGs goal eight and nine with you. Uh, so from this perspective, I guess uh, we found a way for resource mobilization, fund accumulation, and financial inclusion uh, of, uh, of this goal eight and uh, goal nine. So, uh, this is the analysis part. This is the word you see uh, the OIC in the top corner. Uh, so, uh, this model tells us something. So, the colorful uh, countries has a common financial model since centuries, uh, since 12, uh, since uh, second century, even second century from China. I will discuss this with you. What is that? So uh, you see, Europe doesn't have a, a color since Europe doesn't know this model. But uh, in the world now, uh, the European financial model, I mean the banking, is important by other countries. And now that's, that causes a fund accumulation problem, also financial inclusion problem. What can be another solution? I will discuss about that. So what we did, we have collected the uh, the model. If uh, is known in the in these parts of the world, we have collected all the uh, pronunciation of the model. So this is Roska introduced by uh, uh, the Roska term introduced by Dirts in 2000. Uh, uh, sorry, 1962, uh, first time ever. So I will skip this. Uh, it will show a lot. Uh, I will pass this uh, slide. So the term is used for that uh, model. is called uh, Palawagan in Malaysia, Susu in uh, uh, Latin America, or tan Tandas, or uh, in uh, Arabic countries, it is called Jemiya. In Turkey, it is called Gün. In some other countries, they, they do call it Huyi. They do call it Kol. And, uh, this model is very well known in all around the world, but first time ever, uh, GS introduced that model as Roska to the literature. So uh, the term is credit, uh, rotating savings and credit association, Roska. So that model is <coughs> introduced first time by GS, but it is very hot topic in, uh, anthro in the anthropologist world. I'm also a member of a group of uh, scientists working on uh, Roskas uh, from Princeton, Yale, and those universities. They do find a solution for, for the world, for humanity, within this model. So what we did, we have analyzed all the literature. We have collected all the models uh, in the practice. 
we have analyzed the literature, uh, the both the theoretical, empirical parts. We have also found some Sharia compliant, uh, some studies on the Sharia compliance of Roska model, and uh, we brought a solution. We introduced the model as an Islamic financial uh, instrument. We gave the definition. I will come to this, but uh, I, I just want to highlight that Ko is how Japan called Roska. Uh, has a, a contract from the 12th uh, century. So it is in the literature. We, uh, I want to share this contract with you. It is a six uh, 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 item uh, contract. It discusses all the uh, transparency issues, all the fund management issues, and other. Uh, so it, we we have found an interesting experience, which is common in both OIC countries and the other parts of the world. So we thought that this should be an, an Islamic financial instrument to to uh, to reach the SDG goals also. So we introduced this uh, definition for the first time as a a process of agreement among a group of people who agree that each of them contributes a specific amount of money to be used to meet each participant's targeted amount of financing needs based on mutual solidarity and collaboration. So this is a, a risk sharing model, uh, which is a fundamental uh, paradigm of Islamic finance. If we consider that uh, the, the paradigm of Islamic economics is cooperation or collaboration, uh, in the Islamic finance, it, it emerged as risk sharing instead of risk transfer. So this model can be useful for uh, uh, so solving the financial needs of, of uh, uh, OIC uh, countries. Uh, and uh, can increase the financial inclusion in the OIC countries since anyone can make any uh, saving, any amount of saving within this model. Uh, so we have uh, made the uh, theoretical business model for ROSCA also. So this is a, a business model study. Uh, if you if you know Tekaful uh, business model, you will find many similarities between this Roska model and the Tekaful model. So it also approves that this is uh, this can be another tool for Islamic finance, which is ignored till now. Uh, what we did after this analysis, we introduced a, a project uh, to uh, Islamic Development Bank. They decided to support, and we have introduced some uh, um, products in the model to reach SDGs uh, is uh, with, that can be partnered with UN uh, institutions. Uh, so we call this blended Roska. Uh, I I, uh, I can give some uh, hints about those uh, products and the models that can be. Uh, another perspective for Islamic finance also. Uh, so according to uh, blended Roska, the participants will, um, uh, will uh, invest in the risk fund. I mean, they will save for a certain amount. And another uh, portion will come from the UN agencies. So for the parts that need to be developed, uh, for the parts who... who the people are in need uh, in the uh, Muslim world. Uh, that model can bring some solutions with uh, both financial inclusion and uh, Islamic social finance. So, uh, what we we are discussing about our project is in some uh, within some product uh, development uh, issues to to introduce hybrid uh, uh, products for uh, achieving the SDGs. So uh, I guess uh, what I want to discuss finally, I guess Islamic finance can bring some solutions to achieve SDGs, but what we need to do, we need to consider uh, it from another perspective. I mean, 
if we focus on human rights, if we focus, if we discuss always on our next generation and ignore the other cre creatures, uh, we will skip uh, to achieve SDGs and the world will suffer. When you go for um, literature, when you go for news, when you uh, need to analyze the the uh, current uh, carbon emissions and the current uh, uh, position of the uh, world resources, it, it caused an, uh, uh, let's say, unhappiness for any who, who consider, uh, a, who case a better world for all the creatures. So Islamic finance can play a, a, a role with hybrid models, uh, not only in uh, green finance, but also in other uh, segments of the financial uh, uh, engineering. Uh, I want to highlight those, those issues, and I want to thank, uh, thanks for having me and listening. Uh, I guess I use my time efficiently. Uh, uh, I stop sharing screen, right? Uh, yes. yes. Yeah, uh, I can you. I can discuss if uh, if. Yeah, thank uh, you very much, Dr. Yusuf. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, honorable viewers and respected uh, listeners. Uh, we are at the end part uh, of our session. We were listening from Dr. Uh, Yusuf from his practical perspective in terms of um, SDGs and the Muslim world and analysis from his practical experience what he worked, uh, especially in Turkey. So uh, we know our time is very li limited and we are uh, uh, consistent within the time boundary. So hopefully uh, today's session is just to give an idea what Islamic perspective and was, what SDG is and especially what ecosystem uh, restoration denotes from our perspective. So hopefully this is to get an idea and definitely our researchers, our policy makers, uh, they can uh, think on it broadly and hopefully we will discuss uh, more wider uh, sessions in, in next occasion inshallah so uh, at this point of time i would like to request our honorable chair uh, dr aishat muniza she is an associate professor INCEIF malaysia uh, she is the first female deputy minister of ministry of islamic affairs and ministry of finance and treasury republic of maldives and she was the former chairman, board of directors, Maldives Center for Islamic Finance Limited. And not, not last but not the least, she is a research associate with the Australian Center for Islamic Financial Studies, an editorial board member of the Australian Journal of Islamic Banking and Finance, and a member of the Australian Sharia Board for Islamic Finance. Uh, she won gold and silver medals at research, invention, and innovation exhibition in 2012 and 2013 for research conducted on disciplines related to Islamic banking and finance. So I'd like to request our Honorable Chair, Dr. Aisha Muniza, to deliver her speech, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me well? Yes, please. So without further ado, I'd like to first of all thank the organizer for giving us the opportunity to share our experiences in this session. And I also congratulate all the speakers for giving an insight into their thoughts on the topic that we are discussing today. And it is a very good insight into the topic, I would say, because there isn't much things without uh, deliberation here today in terms of understanding the topic from different uh, angles. So what I would like to do today is uh, not giving something new, but briefly, I would like to express my gratitude to all and then uh, share some of the things which I've understood from this session. So the first point I'd like to highlight is that obviously um, we need to understand that Islamic finance and um, environment is something linked with because of Sharia. And in Sharia already green is embedded, meaning that environment protection is part and parcel of Sharia. So as such, what, what we need to do today is activate uh, the trusteeship or the vice gerent role that we have on the earth, which has been given us by God. So meaning that uh, when it comes to environment conservation and restoration, what we need to do is that we need to shoulder the responsibilities which we ought to carry in this world by reviving the role of trusteeship so that at least 
uh, we will be following the religion at the same time we would be fulfilling the role given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us effectively. So this is something we need to do and this is something we need to emphasize on. The next point which I would like to highlight is that when it comes to environment protection, it is very important that we don't waste our resources. Therefore, I'd like to emphasize on using an adoption of circular economy notion so that at least we won't be uh, best wasting our resources. Instead, we'll be conserving it and we'll be um, carrying it to our next generation so that at least they would have something from us. Next point is that it's very important that we know what we are doing in this world right now in terms of human development. As you know, environment is directly linked with human quality of life. So even if you want to achieve SDGs, or even if you are talking about eliminating poverty, which is one of the SDGs, it's important that we conserve our environment and do it in a sustainable manner. And to do that, we have different types of models as well. The last speaker has highlighted one of the models that could be followed. And I believe that uh, in different countries, there are different models followed, and it's a matter of adoption and unifying it for our own use. So this is something, again, very important. The last point which I want to highlight is that when it comes to financing of um, environment uh, and climate changing matters and achieving uh, carbon neutral societies, it's very important that we change the current uh, perception or the current way of doing it. If you look at the different finances and financial institutions in the world, whether it is Islamic or conventional, most of them focus on profitability and also take projects ad hocly by uh, assessing it project by project basis or case by case basis. So there could be a project where they deal with um, green environment uh, features and the finances would be ad hocly involved in those projects rather than looking at it from a general or a holistic perspective. So in this regard, it would be important for the finances to think and realize the carbon impact which is created uh, for every cent which they spend. So that at least uh, instead of looking at uh, from profitability perspective per se, um, it would be catered in a different dimension that would help our environment as well as we will become more resilient to the climate change and we would be able to achieve carbon neutrality as well. So again, when we talk about this aspect, we would face challenges. Challenges here means when the whole society and the whole world is um, driven by profit, definitely state need to intervene, meaning that we need policies uh, for giving subsidy or incentives so that at least there will be more finances and more people who are interested in uh, this kind of a notion whereby we can implement uh, SRI frameworks or value-based intermediation approaches in different countries. So I believe that state intervention in this regard is also very, very important. So with these uh, few key points, I think I'll stop there. And um, last but not least, I'd like to thank the Center for Sustainable Development of Muslim World for initiating um, such a discussion in this timely manner in conjunction with World Environment Day 2021. So may Allah bless all our efforts. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't take much time of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much, our honorable chair, for her very uh, precise but too short uh, concluding remarks. Uh, what we discussed uh, the last one and a half hour, if I just summarize, uh, we got the idea that as uh, we humans have been exploiting and at the same time destroying the planet's ecosystems, and uh, what uh, our discussion, uh, Tipu Sultan, he mentioned rightly that every three seconds, the world loses enough forest to cover a football pitch. And over the last century, we, the human, have destroyed half of the wetlands. And as much as 50% of the world's coral reefs have already been lost, and up to 90% of coral reefs could be lost by 2050, even if global warming is limited to an increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Ecosystem loss is depriving the world of carbon sinks like forests and wetlands at a time when humanity can least afford it. 
and global greenhouse gas emissions have grown for three consecutive years and the planet is one place for potentially catastrophic climate change so finally how can we uh, how can the ecosystem be restored by the human being just a couple of points all kinds of ecosystems can be restored including forests farmlands cities wetlands and oceans and restoration initiatives can be launched by uh, almost everyone every human being including uh, from governments and development agencies to businesses communities and individuals uh, that that is because the cause of degradation are many and varied and can have an impact at different scales so for instance degradation may result from harmful policies such as subsidies from intensive farming or weak tenure laws that encourage deforestation lakes and uh, coastlines can become polluted because of poor waste management or an industrial accident commercial pressure can leave towns and cities with too much at, uh, as planned and for too green spaces so finally uh, as human being uh, from our side we must now fundamentally rethink our relationship with the living world with natural ecosystems and their diversity and work towards east restoration that is the humble uh, uh, request from our side to the listeners and viewers and at the last point i would like to uh, i mean uh, extend our warm gratitude and thanks to our honorable guests especially uh, for joining with us and with these notes uh, i would like to uh, conclude our session here thank you very much everyone again assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh peace be upon all of you again